Good afternoon, everyone. As usual, we're just waiting for all of our viewers to log in. Thank you for joining us. Let us know where you're joining from. Drop your name, drop your country if you want to. And please share the live with your friends and family. Hi, Berta. Hi, Berta. Thanks for joining. <laughs> this is our first time streaming to the Focus on Her Facebook page. So I know a couple people might be lost and they might be trying to see the live on my personal page. I will share the link for you guys, but please send the YouTube link and send the Facebook page to your friends, okay? Hi, Anara. Thanks for joining. All right, we'll wait a couple more minutes and then we'll get started. I can see you all are sharing the live. Thank you very much. Hi, Kimberly, joining from Dominica, welcome. I hope you guys are liking the jazz music today. Jazz is for Sunday, so turn up the volume. Okay, so we will go ahead and get started. Again, welcome everyone and thank you for tuning into episode five of Focus on Her Live. For those of you joining us for the first time, this is section five or segment five of my Let's Talk About series. And this is an extension of my online magazine. If you haven't seen the webpage, please go to www.focusonher.net and check out all of the amazing content on women's health, relationships, and lifestyle that I have on there. So this here, our live series, is just a discussion forum and a safe place for women to share knowledge on topics of interest, especially women's health. Today, we will be talking about depression with my wonderful guest, and I'll introduce her in a second, um, Dr. Deneen Robin. And we are going to discuss the Caribbean cultural approach to mental health. Okay, that's something that I see that as healthcare professionals, we are trying to create more awareness about it, but it's still something that most people are not comfortable talking about as yet. So today I'm hoping to kind of raise more awareness and get everyone involved in mental health. Okay, my guest, Dr. Deneen Robin, she considers herself a mental health advocate and a lover of emotions and people. She was born in Fairfax, Virginia, and she currently resides in Maryland. 
but I want to insert that her parents are from Dominica, so Deneen is Dominican, all right? So Dr. Robin, Dominican. <laughs> she earned her bachelor's degree in psychology with an emphasis in counseling from Oakwood University, a master's in clinical mental health counseling from Bowie State University, and her doctorate in counselor education and supervision from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. She has been practicing uh, for over seven years, and she has worked with individuals dealing with anxiety, depression, life transitions, and severe mental illness. So she's very qualified at what she does. She currently works as the Director of Clinical Training at the Counseling Graduate Programs at Trinity Washington University and provides therapy to working adults in private practice. In her free time, she enjoys spending time with family, friends, doing solo self-care activities, and looking for her next adventure. So Dr. Robin, congratulations on all of your achievements and welcome to Focus on Her Life. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. It is still very weird to hear people say Dr. Robin. Just like, ah, that's me. But yes, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Welcome, welcome. So this um, live event is right up your alley. We are gonna be talking about depression. And for those who probably might not know, what is depression? Like what is the medical definition of depression? Um, so depression, it's also considered, another name for it is also major depressive order or clinical depression um, is a common but serious mood disorder. So it uh, impacts, the mind and the body, and it creates severe symptoms um, that affect how you think, how you feel, and how you handle daily activities, such as your sleeping, your eating, and even your working. Um, so to be diagnosed with depression, there are certain symptoms that have to be present for at least two weeks. Um, and so these symptoms that have to be present for at least two weeks um, come from the DSM, which is the Diagnostic Statistician Manual that mental health professionals use when diagnosing individuals. Um, so for at least two weeks, you should ex um, exhibit at least one of the symptoms um, in addition to a loss of interest or pleasure. Um, so depressed mood most of the day. So nearly every day you're feeling that way. Um, there's a marked diminished interest or pleasure in almost all the activities that you usually like to do. So nearly every day, the things that you usually enjoy doing, you have absolutely no interest doing. Um, also severe or significant weight loss or weight gain or decrease in your appetite nearly every day. Um, so that's a, that's a significant one, because usually when people are stressed or overwhelmed, um, they don't want to eat. Um, so significant weight loss in a short amount of time is a big symptom. Um, also, a slowing down of thought and a reduction of physical movement observable by others, um, not merely based on our like subjective feelings of restlessness, um, fatigue or loss of energy nearly every day, um, feelings of worthlessness or excessive and inappropriate guilt felt every day, um, diminished ability to think or concentrate, having indecisiveness, not able to really make a decision. Um, and then uh, another significant one is any thoughts of like harming yourself, um, in terms of even making a plan to make that happen. So that that is kind of like a big, <laughs> but most significant um, definition of clinical depression that um, mental health clinicians use when we diagnose those who come to see us. Okay, so it seems like depression goes way beyond just feeling sad. Right? Because some people would loosely use the term that, you know, I'm depressed whenever they feel sad or disappointed. So there is a marked difference between depression, which is an actual medical diagnosis, and just feeling sad over something or disappointed um, over something else. And there are different types of depression. Um, in your, you know, in your practice so far, what is the most common type that you've seen? Um, so in my practice, the most common type that I see is actually um, major depression 
um, and adjustment disorder. Um, so usually that diagnosis is when someone is feeling something significant for at least two weeks that is specifically attached to something. Um, so in our sessions, we can usually talk about um, it being maybe a life transition of moving to another state and not being around their support system. It could be a breakup situation with a significant other. Um, so it's usually some sort of life altering event um, that has happened over a two week period that has someone in that space. And so more, more often, that's what I see in my practice of people who are coming to see me. Um, but of course, when that prolongs, when that goes longer than two weeks, um, then we begin to expand more so what sort of depression is this person dealing with. Um, and so the DSM actually goes into depth um, about a lot of other um, mental health depressive um, diagnoses, for instance, um, depression surrounding grief. Grief has now gotten its own um, definition and own section in the DSM because grief can be so expansive. Um, and so often just saying someone's depressed um, due to the loss of a loved one um, usually, of course, goes beyond two weeks. Um, and so because of its um, diversity surrounding grief, it's gotten its own kind of section of for diagnosis purposes. Um, but another thing that I like that you said is that uh, talking about sadness is that everyone gets sad, right? It's an emotion. Everyone gets sad. Everyone gets frustrated. I mean, often it's like, oh, I'm depressed. And it's like, no, you're really just sad, right? Like from, from a professional, I'm like, you're not depressed. You're really just sad um, because everyone has it. It really turns into something when it's gone on longer than um, I want to say a quote unquote normal period of sadness. Yeah, and, and I like that you mentioned it that way that, you know, some people might remark and say, oh, you're not depressed, you're just sad, because that's going to lead into the rest of our conversation as, you know, the Caribbean cultural approach to depression. And growing up in the Caribbean, um, it's really hard to open up about depression because you're afraid that people are going to shun you and just that you know that okay you what depression like <laughs> you don't have depression what are you talking about so yeah. i get that um some people are confused with the definition but i like that you clarified it so this is a medical definition of depression there are different types of depression and i like to say that no two depressive episodes are the same even if they're in the same patient um so that's as far as you know medical you know parameters for depression but for our audience how would they be able to recognize depression in themselves or maybe in their loved ones um so definitely some signs or symptoms um is a persistent sad or kind of empty mood and so that's when engaging with someone that you love and care about, if you're checking in on them and they kind of have no, no um, context or conversation that um, is different than your usual probably conversation with them, right? Or they, it's kind of blank, like, oh, I'm fine. Everything's good. Um, kind of a blanketed response, but nothing real um, behind it. Um, but that is something that's persistent. So not just, you know, people have a day where they don't feel like talking or a couple right. days, you know, um, but it's persistent, right? A constant response of that. Um, also feelings of hopelessness. Um, so talking or hearing um, from a loved one or even from yourself. And if you can't think about um, maybe the future or maybe even the next week, right? It's just kind of like, I'm just gonna keep going um, with the flow. Um, and if something happens, great. But if something doesn't happen, um, they have no desire for something more. Um, and a accompanying that hopelessness is like a pessimistic attitude. So everything is kind of negative surrounding that. Um, another sign and symptom is irritability. Again, sometimes things are annoying, but this is like a marked difference. Um, everything 
is annoying. Everything is going wrong. Also, the response to something is more significant than it should be. So let's say you're cooking and you drop something, right? It's like, oh man, you dropped it, you picked it up, you keep going, right? But if someone who's irritable and it has been irritable for a while, they're dropping something and their response is huge. And it's like, it doesn't coincide with what happened. Um, a big one is loss of interest or pleasure in hobbies and activities. So that's a big question that I ask clients when I come to see them. Like usually let's say they are a, a avid basketball or football player. Um, and I'm asking them about it and they're like, oh, I haven't played in about a month. Right. And I have no desire to play. I have no desire to watch the NBA on TV. Um, so anything that they were getting pleasure out of, they're no longer um, getting. Another one, decreased energy or fatigue. So um, when people are sleeping a lot, right? So sleeping 12, 15 hours a day and they're waking up and they're still exhausted, like sleeping for a week straight. Um, that's another big sign and symptom. Um, difficulty concentrating, remembering, or making decisions. Um, and so sometimes when um, clients are depressed, they have like this mind fog um, and they have difficulty remembering or making decisions. Um, appetite or weight changes, that's another big one to look at for in yourself or others, just not having the appetite to eat anything um, or overeating. Uh, because you're using that to kind of to cope with everything going on. And all you can think about is eating. Um, and then um, definitely, like I said, any thoughts of um, harming yourself um, or having a plan um, of just wanting to end your life um, is another big sign and symptom. And then also sometimes people don't always take into account the physical symptoms of what is happening in your mind. And so sometimes aches and pains and headaches and cramps can absolutely be tied to your mood. Um, and sometimes if you go to a doctor and there's not a clear physical cause of what is happening with the pain or the ache in your shoulders or your back, um, it can absolutely be tied to a mood disorder such as depression. Yeah, and so, so those were a lot of symptoms. <laughs> to be honest, like, our viewers might be, oh my gosh, ticking off like, okay, I have this one, I have that one, I, okay, I don't have this one, but I have the rest. Um, just so you know, guys, um, having all of these symptoms doesn't automatically diagnose you with um, depression. You know, the counselor has to take into context other things that's happening in your lives. And there are also medical conditions like, you know, thyroid disorders, or even in pregnancy, as we, you know, we'll see a little bit later, that could cause or trigger depressive episodes. Um, so if you do have any of these symptoms, please make a note to talk to your therapist the next time you see them. Absolutely, because not everyone who has every symptom or everyone who experiences them experiences them in the same way. So that's why it is so important to talk to a professional when trying to officially diagnose yourself because there's so many other things that are taken into the di context of a diagnosis other than symptoms. Right. So I know we have a lot of our ladies logged in today um, and we're trying to correlate depression with, you know, women's health and quality of life. So just in your experience for your female patients, how has depression really affected their quality of life? Wow. So like when I saw you ask this question, I was like, man, being a woman is so... <laughs> much work. There's so many things that come with being a woman and the things that we experience in our bodies and our mind just so differently than how the male body has been created. Um, and depression is honestly very common and very serious for women. Um, there was a CDC study that showed that nearly one in 10 women in the U.S. experienced uh, major depression in the last year. And I want to say with the pandemic happening, um, the numbers are probably a lot um, 
higher. Um, also, a very common form of depression that women talk about more often is postpartum depression after having children. Um, and it says nearly about one in eight women um, experience some sort of postpartum depression. And in some areas, it can be as high as one in five. Um, and often what happens is women don't, women and people in general, don't know that what they're experiencing is not how they're supposed to feel. So oftentimes when I see clients, I'm like, you don't have to feel this way. You don't have to tough it out. Like I know we'll talk a little bit of, more about the Caribbean um, aspect and influence, but it's like, you don't have to live this way. Um, and so that is a, a significant thing as it relates to postpartum um, depression with women. Yeah, especially with postpartum, there's so much going on. Like you've just gone through, you know, eight to nine months of being pregnant, going through your, your body is literally going through shock, adapting to all of these changes, you know, as you go through pregnancy and now you have a baby. For some people, it might be their first baby. It might be, you know, their, their fourth, fifth, maybe second, third baby. But it's the journey is always different every single time. So you have to adapt not only physically, but mentally. And it's okay not to be okay. You know, it's, it's a lot that you have to take on. I mean, I've, I don't have any children. I've Neither never, you know, that. <laughs> but just seeing other people who have gone through this, it is a lot to take on mentally. And, you know, postpartum depression, you don't have to try and stick it off. Like, you know, like Dr. Robin says, you should really let your doctor, let your ob guide, or let your, your family medicine physician know that, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing well. I can't manage the baby. I feel myself, you know, breaking down every single time I try. And, you know, I'm tired all the time. I can't eat. I can't sleep. And it really, it should trigger you to ask for help when it's really affecting your day-to-day -day life. Like you really can't function. It's one difference if, you know, be tired from work and you're still functioning at your A game that, and then to be tired and not being able to function, not being able, you know, to push and do what it is that you have to do. So these are things that you have to kind of, you know, look at yourself, do some introspection and say, okay, am I really functioning the way that I want to? How is this affecting my life? Can I work? Am I able to hang out with friends and family? Can I maintain my work-life balance? And depression can offset all of these things for you. But the good thing is you can get help. Um, there are ways to combat this thing. It is it is a disease. Uh, so yeah. I'm glad that Dr. Robin is sharing all of this, you know, information with us. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the Caribbean cultural approach to depression um, yeah. before we, you know, we talk about accessing, um, you know, help and resources. Um, just for me, I know growing up, um, no one really talked about depression you know, not like at school or, you know, maybe at church or anything like that. It was often overlooked. So you would know of people struggling, but that's about all you knew. Um, and then if you were the one feeling that way and you probably wanted to open up to someone, maybe a family member or a friend, the response that at least I have gotten is, you depressed? <laughs> what making you depressed that like let me give you something to be depressed right. about <laughs> so, and i'm sure that you know at least one of us in the chat we have experienced this um what has it been like for you i know you have caribbean heritage what do you know about this <laughs> Uh, this is so funny so um so i actually did my dissertation research surrounding um older Caribbean, Black Caribbeans, their attitudes and beliefs towards um, mental health um, in general. Um, and so for me growing up, right, so my parents are Dominican, so I am Dominican by blood and, you know, by love. Um, but growing up um, in an American context, right, mental health is talked about a lot, right? From the time I've been in elementary school, we've had guidance counselors to talk about your feelings. They teach us our, to name our emotions and to talk about them. And then I, I came home and it's completely different. My parents are like, what? Like, this is not a this is not a thing. Like we're not, we're not going to have like these type of conversations. Um, 
because for them, it was something that was never taught to them either. And so they grew up like, we're fine. So, you know, you guys are going to be fine too. So for me, there was a real dissonance that existed between like, I have always been a very emotional person and being a very emotional child and my parents who were not that way, right? They loved me without a shadow of a doubt, but some of the more tangible mental health wholeness um, kind of strategies, it was never really implemented. Um, and so as I've got, as I got older and I learned more about family members or just extended friends and their parents um, who are also with a, have a, that also have a Caribbean background and I saw them struggle and me, I'm like, there are so many resources that exist, but why are you struggling? Um, why don't you reach out? Why don't you talk to someone, right? Because people, they'll go to their doctor, um, some a little bit more reluctantly, but they'll go to their doctor, um, but they wouldn't talk about mental health issues or stress or anything surrounding that. Um, so it led me to like try and figure out what are their attitudes and beliefs without my biased perspective to see what like my my sample said, what does that look like? Um, what do they um, believe about mental health and mental health services? Okay. So that led me to, yeah, my my study. And that's a little bit about my experience. So, so I'm curious now because I want to know what you found out <laughs> from your research. If you want to share a little bit about that. <laughs> Sure. Um, so for in my research, um, so what I did is I I ultimately had eight participants. Um, so part of my criteria, my criteria was that the individuals had to have lived in their country of origin for at least 20 years and then had to have lived in the United States for at least 20 years. Um, and so I, I got also individuals from different islands. So I had someone from Trinidad, someone from Antigua, Barbados, definitely Dominica. Um, so I wanted to get it back at different islands to see if maybe, you know, that played a factor, but honestly it was all the same. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the things that I found that really stood out to me um, from talking to my participants was there was this theme of self-reliance in terms of they have they have always been taught to figure things out on their own or to get by on their own and as a result they feel like they can just depend on themselves for whatever the situation may be um so let's say if someone is struggling with um they're they're depressed we're talking about depression they're depressed they feel like, well, I know that I can just um, listen to music or I, a lot of them said I talk to myself to work out the issue. Um, but when asked about why would they talk to a professional, they were like, no, you know, why would I talk to a professional? How could they help me? Um, another huge theme that I found with them was a, a spiritual component. So a lot of them, we're saying instead of reaching out to a physical person, they reach up. And that was a direct quote from one of my participants in terms of, I pray about it, I talk to God about it or whatever their belief system may be. Um, and that helps me completely to get through. Although some of my participants were still dealing with grief, depression and anger from situations that happened years ago, but they told me that this is what they do when they had a situation. Um, another thing that I found was growing up in the Caribbean context in terms of not talking about their problems or issues, when migrating to the United States, they felt like, why would I change who I am just because I'm in another place? So even though they came to the U.S., right, and they are aware of all of the services that are offered, counselors, psychiatrists, doctors will refer you, there's counseling groups, there's things at churches, even though these exist, I never grew up learning or going to those things. So why should it change now um, that I'm older? And so those are just some of the things. But from that information, I, ac I actually came up with a whole section about self-reliance meaning that they felt like 
I can figure this out on my own. Whatever that looks out looks like, it's just going to be me figuring it out and not reaching out for help. Wow. So that was intense because I can identify with several things that you mentioned. Um, you know, our people, we think we are very strong, resilient people. And mm -hmm. sometimes that self-reliance kind of overrides our ability to ask for help when it's needed. And that's very important. Um, we have a question from one of our viewers. And says, Dr. Robin, how do you help yourself if you do not know you are suffering from depression? Thanks for your question, Ms. Irma uh, Thank you for that question. And I think um, that that is common. One, because thinking about it from the Caribbean context too, right? If this is all you know, because that was also another thing that said, if this is all you know, this is how I am, or this is how my mother was, or this is how everyone was, like, I'm just living my life. Like, how do I know that I don't have to live this way, right? Like, I can get help. Um, and so a really easy way in this day and age, um, so there is a website called Mental Health Screening of America. And on that website, they offer different screening tools for depression, for anxiety. Um, so I suggest going to that website. It's an easy screening um, tool and see what the results say. Um, and then once you have those results, it's really good to talk it over with a doctor um, and definitely a mental health professional. So that's just an easy way to it, it ask prompting questions and then it'll give you an answer at the end. Um, and then also I always, I as a mental health clinician counselor, I recommend that everyone see a professional, a therapist. Um, and sometimes going there, they, in the beginning of the process, there is a questionnaire that's asked to just find out about you um, and find out about things that you're dealing with. And through that initial interview, it's kind of like a screening conversation. Um, they can also give you an idea of what you're experiencing or what's going on with you. And so that's a way if you want to speak to someone directly. Um, but if you're not ready to quite jump in and go to a mental health professional, then definitely uh, Mental Health uh, Screening of America, they offer screening tools and just see what um, the depression one says and then bring those results to uh, your doctor. And so that's a good way to kind of figure that out. And of course, all the symptoms that I talked about earlier, if you've been experiencing um, about two or three of those for at least two weeks, um, that's probably a good indicator that something may be wrong. Um, but if it's definitely been longer than two weeks that you've been experiencing something, um, like months, or it's been more persistent to a year, I would definitely um, talk it over with a professional. That's true. And for those of you living outside of the US, those of you joining us from the Caribbean, different islands here, um, each island should have resources available to you through the Ministry of Health. Um, so you should have access to um, counselors, therapists, psychiatrists through your Ministry of Health, probably through your local clinics if it's set up like that in your country. And you could reach out for help. There should be a number to call. I don't know what it is for every single island, but um, I know that you could find that out from your government directory or the, web, or the internet. So please reach out to your um, resources through the Ministry of Health. Um, speaking about mental health professionals, because some people actually don't know this, what is the difference between therapist, counselor, psychiatrist? Because some people, as soon as they hear depression, they think, oh, you want to send me to a psychiatrist. I am not crazy. So what's right. the difference between these professions? So a psychiatrist um, for the U.S. and actually most commonly everywhere, a psychiatrist is a mental health professional who has an MD degree, right? And with that MD degree, um, they usually um, have a mental health knowledge to prescribe medication for whatever issue that you're dealing with. In some situations, there are psychiatrists who um, do a little talk therapy, which means they may talk to you um, 
and get background information about what you're experiencing. Um, they may check in with you every appointment, but primarily their responsibility um, is to prescribe medication. There are some psychiatrist settings where they actually have longer sessions with uh, patients or clients, but that is not common. Their usual plan is to, um, they have an extensive knowledge of medications, um, is to prescribe um, medications to help people. And so they honestly have a negative rap because people are like, I'm not crazy because people with severe mental illness usually go to a psychiatrist because they are most likely on a medication regimen and that psychiatrist is following them closely. Um, as for a counselor or therapist, depending on where you are, um, they, can, they can mean the same thing, um, but so in the U.S., we there are licensing boards, and so for the counselor and the therapist, and for even some social workers who have a clinical background, they have been trained to administer therapy as an intervention. And so there's different forms of therapy that you may um, encounter with someone based on what you're experiencing. There are those trained in specific areas, like a trauma background, um, and there, then there are those who are diverse in many backgrounds. And so based on that licensing, they have the designation as a licensed counselor or a licensed therapist. Um, and then they provide you with the therapy that um, you're looking for. Um, they also cannot uh, prescribe medication. Um, and so, and they're the ones that are going to walk you through the process of um, attaining whatever goals you set in therapy. So usually for someone who's experiencing something a little bit more severe, um, their treatment plan looks like having a therapist, counselor, and a psychiatrist. That combination, because the psychiatrist is going to be there for the medication issues, and the therapist is going to be there to kind of walk you through the entire process um, of therapy and reaching your goals. And sometimes medication helps that to happen. OK, so I hope our viewers got all of that. Um, you know, just trying to erase the stigma surrounding the word psychiatrist, because people get scared when you tell them, oh, you need to go talk to someone. I know this, you know, and from the moment they are psychiatrists, they are like, no, no, I'm not crazy. I don't need this. I'm okay. I'm yeah. fine. And that's pretty much the approach that, you know, we see in our Caribbean islands. And I'm hoping that, you know, little by little, we will grow out of this little bracket and have people, you know, feel comfortable reaching out for help. Um, one thing I wanted to chat a little bit more about was just access in schools because our kids, teenagers, adolescents, they all, they could suffer from depression too. Absolutely. So I know that in some schools in Dominica, um, I know of some people who are behavioral um, counselors, you know, child um, therapists in the schools to help these teenagers navigate puberty and all of these changes that are happening oh. to them all at once. Um, what is your advice for parents who are not open to accepting that their child might be suffering from depression or maybe adjustment disorder? Yeah, um, I think, yeah, that's a big one um, because if children and teenagers are given the help that they need at that age, um, then they'll be a better functioning adult and won't have real adult issues um, to deal with. Um, and I think the first question that I would ask a parent, right, who is having difficulty um, wanting to engage their child in that type of conversation or just anyone in that conversation about their child dealing with something, I would ask, what is, what is wrong with that happening? Right. Like what is what are you feeling when that comes up? Are you feeling shame? Right. Are you feeling disappointment? Are you even feeling confused? Right. And or and fear. And because of those things, are is that preventing you from giving your child or trying to explore if your child needs help or support with something? Because oftentimes when we have our children, um, we have our thoughts, our dreams, our plans for them, or even what we know as to be acceptable, or we just want them to, you know, go to school, make a grades, have a successful life. Um, 
And we do not often uh, see that they could, uh, they, that they're, they're dealing with issues that could also uh, be benefited by dealing with. Um, so definitely one, ask yourself that question. What's preventing you from exploring that? Um, and then also know that as growing up in today's world, it's a lot different than growing up even when I was younger or for people who are older um, growing up in their era. And so kids today deal with a lot of things. And whether or not you completely understand what they're dealing with, providing your child a space to talk to you can do a world of a difference. And whether or not it's you or a professional or a good friend or someone you trust, maybe it's not you as a mom, but it's your, your sister or your brother. So they're on the uncle who they may have a relationship with, but just creating that space on attempting to understand what is this child going through? What are they struggling with? And how can I help them, right? We don't want, like I've been saying, if they don't have to live that way, don't create a space where that is the only alternative for them. So definitely try and create a space where your child can talk about whatever they're going through. And from that, moving on to trying to figure out what are specific supports. So the same way if your kid came to you with a stomach ache or if your kid came with a broken leg or some sort of physical ailment and they needed help and you take them to the doctor, you take them to um, someone who can help them, it's the same way if they say, mom, I um, have been feeling really sad and I don't know why for the last two weeks. Find someone who can also help them and be there and listen to them. Good. I actually have nothing to add to that. That was so <laughs> well said. So hopefully <laughs> our parents who are tuned in, um, you know, you're able to catch that because it's very important for you to be a safe space for your children. Um, I mean, if they're not gonna open up to you, they will open up to someone else. So you might as well be their anchor. And I mean, I, I would think that's what you want to be in their lives. Uh, we have another question from one of our viewers. And what can you tell me about schizophrenia? So schizophrenia is a severe mental illness. Um, so it, um, there's so much, so I'm like, how do I, narrow this down. Uh, schizophrenia is a very misunderstood diagnosis, um, meaning that people with schizophrenia, they get a bad rap. They're usually a, the face of mental health because it's like, this is what a crazy person looks like, right? And if I don't, I don't have that, so there's nothing wrong with me. Um, so people with schizophrenia can look like those who have uh, visions or hallucinations, right? They may be seeing things or hearing things. So they have auditory and visual hallucinations, delusions. Um, they have visions of grandeur. So they're, they're often um, doing things that are, um, or seeing things that are, um, I don't want to say grand, but they, so they may let well let me break it down. I have a I had a client and let's say for his visions of grandeur, he could be sitting in my room and then all of a sudden see an army of people coming into the building, right? Like this is what he was seeing and this is what he was hearing and what he was experiencing. Um, and there are a lot of neurological reasons as to why some of that uh, happens um, in our in our brains, we all have something called neurotransmitters. And with those neurotransmitters, there are things like serotonin and dopamine. Um, and when some of those things are very much increased, um, there can be mental illness that is a result. And so what doctors try and do is give medication to help even out those levels. Um, but there are there's a lot of controversy sometimes around it because sometimes people feel like the medication um, does not uh, bring the person back to a level of normalcy that they once knew or didn't know. Um, and so they can feel <laughs> particular ways about that. Another thing about schizophrenia is that the age of onset is usually um, 
early 20s, like so late teens, early 20s, um, that is often a time marked by when someone um, is diagnosed with schizophrenia. They usually have somewhat of a psychotic break um, and they have very bizarre behaviors. Um, and so as a result, they can also um, get that diagnosis there. There's research surrounding different um, street drugs creating environments in the brain that can produce schizophrenia. Um, schizophrenia, it, it, it's, I'm trying to find the words, but it's such a, it's such a complex and big diagnosis. It but like is. It's a bad rap because it's often the face of what people think is crazy. When people are talking to themselves or seeing things, um, their people's, their, their care for themselves are diminished because they're caught mm -hmm. up. There are different types of schizophrenia. People can become very paranoid. It's complex, but hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> yeah, so it's really, it's an imbalance in the hormones in the brain. You know, just simply put, um, you can either have too much, too little, and it causes, that imbalance causes the patient to see things that are not there in real life or hear things that are not there and their level of function is severely decreased. And it can be associated with so many, you know, conditions. It could be associated with psychosis, which is what, you know, commonly we say crazy. It could be associated with depressive episodes, manic episodes, um, you know, so there is a portion of schizophrenia that might be related to depression. So if you have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, and you feel like, you know, you know, I'm having some of the symptoms, you know, I'm hearing Dr. Robin and Dr. Luke talking about today, then it might be that you, you're having depressive episodes. So of course you need to talk to your, your therapist, your doctor to see, you know, to reevaluate what is going on. And like Dr. Robin says, um, there are medications that we would prescribe to help restore the balance in the brain. Of course, these medications also have a lot of side effects that are, you know, might not be pleasant to the patient. So it's really a complex topic that I feel should have its own Absolutely. live segment or its own webinar or something else. But thank you for asking. Um, it's really important um, to know what's going on in those mental health conditions. Um, okay, so same viewer is saying, don't get that anymore. I don't like the medications, but I take them as. Um, I'm really happy that you are sticking to your medication regime. That's really good. And I hope that you feel better with each new day. I know every day is not the same, but thank you for sharing that um, personal comment with us. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so we are just about ready to wrap up the session. I just wanted to chat a little bit more about resources that are available to everyone. So I know some of our viewers are in the US, some are in the Caribbean. Um, there are a lot of online resources. Can you share a little bit about what you recommend in your practice? Absolutely. Um, so if you are US based, there are so many different resources um, online that can get you connected to a mental health professional. Um, so if you're looking for a therapist in the US, um, I suggest you always start with psychologytoday.com because that website has so many therapists in different areas. It talks about insurance. It talks about specialties. Um, and that's often a good a good place to start um, for looking for one. Um, also, um, in this day and age, there are online platforms if you want to connect with a therapist on your phone. So there's websites like BetterHelp um, that you can connect with a the therapist online. Um, and then I think you can pay out of pocket. It might, depends on the price. Um, some sometimes insurance companies will reimburse you, but those are um, places, good places to start. So Psychology Today and BetterHelp.com is another website. Um, and then always, if you are ever experiencing anything, I always say start with a primary care physician, your primary care physician, 
tell them what you're going through, they have referrals. They will refer you to someone um, who can help you. Um, and oftentimes, they're not going to give you medication right away. They will send you to a mental health professional to get a diagnosis, to get um, more assistance. And then if they feel like medication is something they want to come back to, that is always um, available. But definitely just start with having the conversation with someone you can trust or have talked about your health profile with. And that's usually your primary care doctor. Um, but I think what's also important to say is that depression, even in its most severe cases, can be treated. And so there's always hope if you or someone you know is struggling um, with depression. There's always someone that you can talk to um, in your life, hopefully, um, that can be there for you. But then in a professional case, there should be someone hopefully in your community that you can reach out to for professional help. Um, and then some general tips that I give clients even um, in treatment is one, always try and be active um, and exercise. And so that does a world of benefit for your health. Um, a 30 minutes of exercise a day is equal to a low dosage of an antidepressant. So I would, I always uh, recommend um, activity and exercise to get your heart rate going, to get your brain stimulated. Also, um, try not to isolate yourself, right? Let others help you. Reach out to those that you are close to. Um, and even if you don't want to tell them everything, um, just ask someone to just be a presence for you or spend some time with them. Um, also, uh, keep those that you identify as a trusted friend or relative close. Um, and definitely, if there, if you are feeling anything at all um, in regards to your mood, I would absolutely always say to postpone important decisions. So when you are in this space, it's probably not a good idea to make huge life decisions and transitions because that will just increase what you already are going through. So just try and discuss it with someone, someone who can be objective um, for your situation. Then of course, continue to educate yourself about depression. And so Today was an awesome way to begin that education and to begin that process, but there are so many resources online and articles and research being done all the time about depression, um, but absolutely start there. And of course, sleep and diet impact your mood drastically. If I don't get enough sleep, it is over for me, right? Like I need sleep. Um, and for some people, they need food. If they don't eat food, their mood is drastically um, changed. And so at, at a basic level, eating and sleeping, you want your body to be able to perform for you in the way that it, it can perform, but we have to take care of our body. So starting with activity, food, and sleep are often like the basic and best ways to start taking care of yourself. Awesome, those were very awesome tips. And I hope, you know, our viewers were able to, you know, make a mental note of, you know, at least a couple of them. So again, if you, if you have depression, if you think you might be suffering from depression, if you know of someone who might be struggling with it, Again, we've gone through several tips, um, you know, on how to recognize it, how to get help, you know, ways you can reach out to different healthcare professionals to get yourself to functioning at your A game. We all want to be the best version of ourselves. Um, so yes, don't don't be afraid to ask for help. I think that's the main thing I wanted to echo and know that you are not alone. Okay, you are never alone in this battle. We are here as you know, healthcare professionals, family members, friends, and just people who want to see others do well. So thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Dr. Robin, for this free consult. <laughs> Please don't fool <kill> me. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing your knowledge with our viewers of today. Of course, I'm so glad, I'm so glad. Thank you. Before we sign off, I wanted to remind you of 
the campaign that I am running, so the back to school campaign. Remember, we have tumblers, um, and you can get yours with 5% off. Um, the link should be somewhere in the chat, and it should be on my screen as well. So go ahead, if you're in the US, take advantage of this deal. You can purchase a Tumblr, and for every Tumblr purchase, funds go towards my back to school campaign. I also want to share with you the GoFundMe campaign that is also running and will end on August 15th. Um, again, you can contribute. Go ahead, click, uh, click on the link in the chat or visit the campaign. It's on the Focus on Her Facebook page. Go ahead and contribute. All proceeds will go towards um, a few Dominican girls who will be starting a new school in September. And it is my goal to help these girls get through to their education and career dreams. So again, if you're willing, please contribute to these um, campaigns all under my back to school campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to those who have already contributed. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, I appreciate you. So thanks for logging in, everyone. I am signing off. Have a good evening and a good weekend.